Um, ju just, just a few words. I, I first met John at a conference on uh, actually, sp well, originally spam, because uh, Mog was mostly about spam uh, at the beginning. But now they, uh, they talk about uh, malware, uh, mobile threats, etc. But it's a conference mostly about uh, uh, email threats mm -hmm. uh, from the beginning. And actually, it's quite an interesting audience. You have a lot of ISPs, uh, a lot of people uh, looking at spam. And uh, it's um, if you if you don't know about Mog, uh, maybe uh, look at their conferences or look at joining. It, it can be interesting uh, uh, to come from time to time to uh, to their conferences. Um, and John would like to share his views on uh, takedowns and uh, maybe uh, spark discussions on the issue. Mm. Uh, so you have the floor, John. Sure, Thank certainly. You. Uh, so good news, we're, we're running a few minutes ahead, so if I go over, you'll still be on time for pizza, hopefully, uh, or, if, or if a lot of questions are asked. So um, my name's John Bamanek. I work for a company of Fidelis Cybersecurity. I aspire that that is the last time I say cyber in this, pre uh, this presentation, but it's not my fault. I didn't name the company, but, you know, but I do cash the paychecks. So uh, been in the industry about 16 years. I am also a faculty member at the University of Illinois in uh, Champaign-Urbana, uh, teaching uh, some CS classes uh, and produce some open source intelligence feeds uh, based on DGA stuff, which you can see there. And I'm assuming that several of you probably already use and look at that. So uh, for this talk, kind of sharing restrictions, right? This is all basically TLP green. It's streamed on the internet, whatever. So everything I talk about is essentially public. There are some private things that go into my conclusions. So if you want to ask me about that, because at certain points I'm going to be intentionally oblique uh, because I had to remove some stuff from the slides because uh, they became law enforcement issues a couple of days ago. Uh, so if I get oblique, feel free to talk to me later and I may, uh, may be able to disclose more. But for everything I say up here, tweet, tweet away. Uh, you can make fun of me on Twitter, I don't care. <laughs> Peter. <laughs> um, so. Most of my talks, I begin with, with uh, you know, this slide, right, the problem statement, and we all kind of know this, right, is that, uh, you know, we're kind of on the losing, losing end of an arms race, you know, with malware and botnets and the whole, whole security space, right? Everything that we do, you know, is in public, right, because they can buy our products, you know, virus total, 57 antivirus engines, they can pre-generate all their malware to make sure it's clean. You know, everything they do is private, takes us a lot of work uh, to get around. Uh, the reason that's relevant for this particular presentation is kind of goes into my philosophy of takedowns is that the economics and the status quo favors the criminals. Uh, and I generally focus exclusively on criminal threats uh, because eventually, you know, occasionally we can put somebody in jail. I can't really solve the intelligence agency problem. People have been spying on other nations for other years. So, you know, the short version of this is we're all doomed, but everybody in this room is going to be working forever. Even if you're a serial screw up, because we know serial screw ups in our industry and they still get paid, right? There's more work than anybody could ever do in their lifetime. So, you know, unlimited job security, right? That's good news. You know, uh, another, another way of putting it, right, from the onion, you know, China can't keep up with hiring enough hackers to hack U.S. stuff. Kind of an American-centric slide, but, yeah, but it amuses me. And hopefully, you know, some of this is humor, because last talk of the day, so hopefully, hopefully lighting it up a little bit. So my kind of general approach to taking things down, right, you know, I'm kind of a belligerent Irishman. Bambanek may, you know, confuse you. It's not really an Irish name. You know, it's kind of Ellis Island Polish, but I am half Irish, and if I'm not breaking things, I'm bored, and if you talk to my wife when I'm bored, then I get into trouble, you know, so she tries to, you know, have me do chores or something just to keep me from, you know, causing problems for myself. I generally like just breaking and smashing things, right? You know, that's kind of my mindset. That's not everybody's mindset. That's cool. Uh, subject of debate, which I'm sure we'll come up with, or uh, we'll get to soon. What is a takedown? I'm sure everybody here knows what it is, but briefly, right? You know, uh, you know, is it a marketing ploy? In some cases, takedowns have been marketing ploys, right? You know, but it's treated as something that's distinct, a distinct and special action that stands alone. I argue that it's not, and we'll get there in a second. You know, uh, just uh, you know, about 30 minutes ago, I read about a law enforcement operation, uh, generally U.S.-based, of just taking down 30,000 some odd counterfeit goods shopping sites over over the shopping American holidays of Black Friday and and 
the ongoing rampant commercialism that we make Christmas in the United States, right? You know, it's, it's fishing, right? That's a takedown. People do that all the time. But when you talk about botnets, it gets to be more controversial, right? You know, getting a hosting company to clean up their network, is that a takedown, right? Uh, there's a specific case uh, on Angler that we'll talk about as we go. My definition, right? You know, I get to define my terms because I've got a microphone, right? So, you know, that way I can make sure I define it to, to already uh, align with my predefined conclusions. Um, you know, is some kind of disruptive action to achieve, you know, some objective, right? It is objective focused. There is some intent aside of I want to blow stuff up for the sake of blowing stuff up, right? You know, we can all blow stuff up. That's cool. But try to achieve some objective. And ideally, that objective will not be having a takedown. Okay. Why do them? Okay. I work for a security vendor now. Previously to that, well, I guess my, my company still exists, but I was independent for a long time. You know, but generally, we've all got clients. You know, and most, for the most part, like our products, you know, we don't increase our bottom line you know, by doing takedowns. You know? It's good media, which is both good and bad. It's part of the problem of takedowns, right? You know, but we're paid to protect our customers. And generally speaking, taking things down, you know, can lead to a chain of events that have adversaries move around our ability to detect them, right? So it's counterintuitive. Uh, that being said, you know, my sense of, you know, of altruism kicks in is that for the most part, the people who most need protection, certainly when you're talking about crime, are not necessarily buying our products. They're not enterprises. You know, no one's going to spend $100,000 for my company's box to protect their house. That would be silly, right? You know, but these are the people getting robbed every day. Uh, so kind of my, my sense of, you know, building a better society, and I won't say cyberspace because I don't want Peter making me drink, um, you know, is, is helping those people that aren't protected by our technologies, which means we have to do something else. There has to be disruptions, arrests, so on and so forth, okay? So the general debate, right, uh, of whether or not to do takedowns, right? You know, attackers will adapt. So, you know, they move around uh, our ability to detect them. You know, takedowns are ineffective, do more harm than good. Uh, and the question of whether law enforcement uh, should be involved. We'll go through each. Okay. So the, the question of adaption of adversaries, right? You know, and this is kind of a philosophical point, right? Everything we do is public, and they adapt to everything we do. Every time we create a new rule, AV signature, blacklist, whatever, you know, they adapt to it because everything we do is disrupted. That's what we're paid to do. We're paid to block them from infecting our clients, and they will adapt around that as much as possible, right? So whether it's AVs, firewalls, blacklists, for instance, and the example with DGAs. For those who look at my, or use my DGA feeds, right, I just enumerate the entire list of a DGA of domains, resolve all of it, strip out sinkholes, here you go, here's an intelligence list. Not an operations list, don't put it into a firewall, but an intelligence list. You know, and attackers know that I do this because it's a public resource, and every now and then they know their DGAs, they'll just have their DG, you know, buy a domain and point it to something else, not their infrastructure, for instance, 8.8.8.8, .8 .8 .8 .8, right? In an attempt to troll us or break things, right? If they're really clever, they would have used the DNS root servers, you know, which really would break things because people do, despite me telling them not to, take those IP lists and put them into a firewall. You know, but the point is, is they observe what we're doing, right? You know, and they adapt. And it doesn't matter how much impact there is, right? You know, now in terms of the entire spectrum of disruptive activities, takedown certainly is on the more extreme end, but certainly not the most extreme. You know, arrests obviously being an extreme form of disruption. You know, I suppose predator drones and just blowing stuff up would be probably the farthest out there. But short of immunity, I'm not going to be in that business. Um, you know, if somebody here can give me immunity and predator drones, let's have that conversation. You know, but, uh, you know, it's just a form of many types of disruptions that we already do, right? So there are, you know, the question is, oh, they'll adapt and whatever. They adapt anyway. Uh, ineffective, right? Certainly, we can all go through lists of, of takedowns that have been ineffective in the past. We'll go through some case studies and some negative case studies to show that. But just because, you know, somebody's an idiot who doesn't know what they're doing and just kind of randomly shooting at things doesn't mean that more thoughtful approaches uh, to doing this work uh, won't yield fruit, right? Uh, and certainly, there's been a couple of times there's been uh, very much uh, a great deal of collateral damage. 
uh, in one case in particular, we'll talk about that. But that being said, there have been successes. You know, Configure, uh, you know, Zeus, CryptoLocker with Operation Tovar, Ramnet, not going to talk about to a great deal, uh, Drydex to an extent, not going to talk about that, but there was an arrest uh, for that, and arrests are good things. I like people in jail. You know, I can't put them there, but the more that they go there, the, the, the happier that makes me, right? Because, you know, that's just me. So doing more harm than good, right? You know, uh, and part of that, you know, is adaption, but part of that could be, you know, questions of collateral damage. Um, you know, so, uh, and I guess the example I'm going to use is no IP and that takedown, right? You know, where there was a whole lot of collateral damage based on, I want to say it was 15, 20,000 host names that uh, wanted to be seized and basically blew up an entire company and the millions of customers that they have, you know, okay, that was kind of a bad thing, right? Um, but it's important to keep in mind of the consequences, you know, of our behavior, right? Not doing things thoughtlessly, but having an objective in mind, right? So two quick examples, right? You know, with Configure, there was some delay, and I don't know if anybody here was part of the Configure working group. I wasn't, but, uh, you know, there's some delay because a lot of Configure machines were medical equipment. So what happens if we disrupt C2 communications to a medical device infected with Configure? Because at a certain point, now you're talking life safety, potential life safety issues. And that had to be examined and dealt with to make sure that, you know, somebody's pacemaker or uh, the life support system just didn't stop working because people dying would be a bad thing. Uh, at least good, innocent people dying would be a bad thing. Right? Um, the other example uh, is ransomware. And I'll use in the case for CryptoLock, we'll talk more in a little bit detail about that in a few minutes. But one of the things that slowed us down you know, in terms of, of taking it down. We could have took it down fairly quickly and early on. We had the capability of doing it. But the question was, you know what, there's a lot of people who didn't pay ransom and had their files encrypted. If we take down their infrastructure and just shoot it in the head, they're never going to get their files back. You know, we knew there was a server out there that had the private keys, and eventually, you know, that server was retrieved and a service was created. You know, but that would have been an example, you know, of collateral damage. Okay, yeah, we did a takedown, but all those files that got encrypted, Sorry, homie, you're out of luck. Um, not an ideal response. Like I said, in some cases, that may be, you know, where you end up. Uh, you know, but there's a weighing involved. Uh, and law enforcement being involved, right? You know, and, and my first question is define involved, right? You know, there is uh, obviously the best outcome, you know, that we can get is arrests. And not just arrests of, like, some money mule or some, you know, affiliate or low-level person arresting, you know, the top of the food chain and all the people, right? You know, that's the ideal. Uh, we're not always going to get to the ideal because of jurisdictional issues and all sorts of, sorts of other things that we're already aware of, right? You know, if there's an actor in, uh, inside the Russian Federation, unless I can get the FSB motivated, you know, there's not going to be an arrest, certainly if there's no Russian victims. And the only time I've ever gotten Russian law enforcement excited and working on something that I reported to was because it involved the Chechen, right? <laughs> then they were, then they, they're like, yeah, give us everything, we'll, we'll take care of this. But short of that, they've, they've, they'll take things quietly, but, you know, it's just kind of into the bit bucket. Uh, I don't know to what extent agency is a legal doctrine outside of the United States. Right? But at a certain point uh, in, in U.S. legal doctrine, uh, you know, there's being an agent of the government. Right? If, I am t if I were to be tasked by the FBI, hey, FBI says, hey, John, go do this, then there's a question, am I a government actor, an individual actor? And it, comes, it brings into all sorts of uh, liability issues that, I'd rather, that most people in the private sector don't want to deal with. Uh, and I don't know what, to what extent, and I get the impression that that's probably mostly a U.S. problem. Right? But at a certain point saying, you know what, I'm, I'm being an agent of the federal government creates a lot of problems and it adopts a lot of liability that private actor, actors ought not to be adopting in the first place. Um, so, let's see. Uh, getting law enforcement involved, like I said, revolves around one issue, right? And there may not be open cases or there may not. But that one issue is, is you know, if I want to call Eric and say, hey, there's something I want to take you a look at, his first question, and feel free to tell me if I'm wrong, is, are there any French citizens impacted? Right? You know, I pay taxes to my government. You guys pay taxes to your respective government. And generally speaking, we pay for law enforcement to protect our citizens. Global economy, global, you know, Internet, right? But still nation-based law enforcement. So uh, in order to get that information... 
You know, sometimes I have to take down some piece of something to say, hey, you know what? There's 50,000 French citizens infected, you know, of this banking Trojan. Okay, you know, and now, now I've got some damage. Now I can say, hey, this law enforcement agency should take a look at something. Right? So sometimes you have to act and have some of these partial, uh, you know, partial disruptions just to get the information to really get the law enforcement uh, and start it. Okay. My personal approach, you know, in terms of what I do is that generally speaking, when I start to get to where I'm getting operational on something, I'll certainly talk to law enforcement to find an open case, right? Uh, you know, I work pretty closely with the FBI, citizen of the U.S., right? That's relatively easy, you know, but it gets interesting, you know, when I'm starting to deal with foreign law enforcement. Uh, you know, and part of the reason I've been traveling, you know, about half the time this year is meeting with law enforcement just so I, you know, when I call on the phone, hey, I know that guy, he's a good guy, okay, we'll have a conversation because, you know, otherwise, why is this American calling, uh, you know, uh, the law enforcement in Bucharest, you know, what do I care what he has to say, right? And, and he's asking about an open case, right? Probably a conversation that, 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 that hopefully says, you know, this is, might be intelligence gathering. We ought not to have this conversation, you know. But being able to have, you know, an idea if there's an open case and say, hey, listen, I'm going to go after something. I don't want to blow up any criminal cases, right? If I don't know, if, if I don't know that they're looking at something and I just kind of kick over the hornet's nest, can wreck evidence, do all sorts of things, right? You know, so I'll at least say, hey, is there an open case? If so approach it more as a law enforcement problem. That will not necessarily stop me from doing something if, uh, if there isn't, right? You know, if there's no law enforcement interest for whatever reason, okay, well, you know, then it's fair game for me to use it as a personal, uh, personal chew toy. So, you know, you know, that said, I'll, I'll work with law enforcement almost anywhere to, to take something down and blow something up. I, you know, whatever I can do to put more people in jail makes me a happy person. All right, you know, last point, you know, takedowns as marketing ploys. Right. It, it's kind of a, a notorious problem, you know, with security vendors who engage in actions and activities that really are nothing more than self-promotion. Uh, and certainly takedowns have, have been used that way in the past, but certainly not the only way uh, self-promotion happens in ways that are obtrusive and, and obnoxious, right? You know, and just we as an industry need to stop that behavior and stop letting marketing define what we do. And, and use marketing as a tool to whatever, get something done. Yeah, we got to sell product, great. You know, but marketing shouldn't say, hey, you know what? I want you to go blow up a botnet uh, so we can go get on CNN. You know, no, get out of here. Um, so, objectives, right? You know, part of my definition, right? You're trying to achieve some cognitive, you know, uh, cognizant objective that you want to accomplish by a takedown. Ideally, not a takedown for the sake of a takedown, because that's kind of silly. You want to do something, right? You know, it might be a, a remediation, a, a full remediation of a threat, victim notification, the whole yards, you know, uh, certainly as part of an arrest. Um, you know, somebody was arrested, got the head actor, okay, now let's decapitate everything, uh, and then, you know, start cleaning up after it, you know, but having some objective, right? Uh, and some of those outcomes, you know, that you may have in mind, some objectives may not lead to, you know, takedown being your first choice, right? So knowing what you actually want to accomplish versus, you know, I woke up, I'm in a bad mood, you know, didn't get a good night's sleep, my kids kept me up, I'm gonna go blow up a botnet, sure, why not, right? Okay, uh, you know, there's probably more, you know, creative ways and constructive ways as, uh, to use uh, adversarial actors as a chew toy. So, case studies, right? The first I mentioned already is no IP, right? So, uh, many campaigns, shouldn't be a surprise to anybody in here, you know, are using dynamic DNS, specifically no IP. Uh, certainly at the time, we're using no IP for, uh, you know, DNS uh, services. Right. Uh, I want to say just based on my current data, I think 65% of stuff says dynamic DNS is still using no IP, VitalWorks. Uh, what Microsoft did essentially, they went to court uh, and said, hey, uh, here's X number of domains all hosted by this company. They're providing service for a criminal enterprise. They stated that there was no plausible way to work with this company to deal with this problem. So give us control of their name servers so we can clean up their DNS space for them. You know, and like I said, hilarity did not ensue because things blew up for a while and, and it was kind of a bad day for all involved. Okay, Microsoft 
took over third-party infrastructure that they were unprepared to manage, right? So um, certainly an excessive step for what they were trying to do. But, you know, there is a certain subset of takedowns where, you know, I'm going to take over and operate the infrastructure, you know? Well, if you don't know what you're doing, things can fail in spectacular and horrific ways, especially when talking about something like DNS. So, you know, this happened, okay? Ideally, only supposed to target, I, I want to say it was 10 to 20,000. I think 15,000 is the name that comes to mind, and I, I couldn't find the, the pleadings off the top of my, uh, uh, with a search. You know, but ultimately, right, you know, there's a lot of damage to all involved. You know, and Microsoft looked quite poor, and rightly so, because it really was a bad move on their part. Uh, the other thing that it led to is uh, uh, not quite in earnest, you know, but a little bit. There are now other dynamic DNS providers out there, and there's some open source tools where you can kind of fire up a shared server somewhere and start being your own dynamic DNS provider. So now, instead of, you know, having one general place to go, now it can kind of be anywhere, and there's some kind of, you know, kind of diffusion uh, of dynamic DNS service that probably will provide some complications going forward. Not quite yet, but getting there. Okay. Other things done wrong, right? No real cooperation with outside entities. Microsoft just kind of did this on their own as far as they did. You know, no apparent risk assessment. Nobody really wants to talk between those two entities about what really happened. But, you know, from the cheap seats, right? Nobody said, what happens if we can't manage those name servers? You know, because, you know, what did happen is that everything broke, you know, for millions of people. And that was kind of a bad day, you know. Uh, and like I said, the key point is there, you know, is that they tried to take over third-party infrastructure that they didn't really know how to manage, which is a bad day, right? Uh, and like I said, sometimes there's a place for running, you know, actually operating, you know, malicious infrastructure, probably not over the long term because there's legal issues involved with that, you know, but there have been certain, certain takedowns where, you know, we're going to sit there and take over the malicious infrastructure to gather more intelligence for a defined period of time. And if you don't know what you're doing, things can break in spectacular and horrific ways. Okay. Second case study is Configure, right? <sighs> This is the other end of the spectrum of contrast, right? Huge group involved of people all over the world, you know, ultimately involved, I mean, it was 150 uh, GTLDs, you know, so registrars all over the place of trying to do this. It was strictly DNS-based only, so they were able to do a, a strict, you know, domain, uh, domain seizure to grab all the infrastructure, and there you go, right? Uh, you know, in contrary to, 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 to no IP, the adversarial control of the infrastructure you know, was taken over, and no one was, uh, af after the operation was launched, you know, the adversary was not able to reassert control, right? So Confec are still dead and gone, for instance, even though there's, what, 600,000 IPs, give or take, uh, that are still infected with Conficker, right? Um, you know, there were some arrests that occurred, um, uh, and, and from the public reporting, like I said, you know, the FBI hinted that Conficker was part of the reason, but never explicitly stated, so, you know, some tangential connection, right? But nothing ever publicly said, you know what, we got the guy who organized it, put it together, put him in jail, right? Did decapitate it, no longer a threat, right? But, uh, you know, it, it doesn't look like the primary actors were arrested, okay? Third case study, Kelios, pick one. There's been four different takedowns to date, as far as I know. Um, you know, uh, so one happened to be on stage, I want to say at Black Hat, uh, three years ago, I forget exactly when, you know, and that particular one, I, I want to say they were back uh, to full strength, uh, not quite by the end of the talk, but pretty close, right? Uh, so, yeah, you, you got to sit there and look at the graphs and go, ooh, you know, and the press said, yay, look at this, right? You know, and I don't necessarily want to impugn the motives of the people involved, but it's really hard to see any value in what that did, aside of, hey, you gave a talk at Black Hat and got the media to talk about it. You know, congratulations, good for you, right? You know, I get the media to talk about anything at Black Hat by submitting a fake talk and canceling it two weeks prior saying an intelligence agency told me I can't talk about it, right? Because that happens every year. Um, you know, it's true, right? It's programmatic at this point. Um, it, this one generally involved like peer-to-peer -peer poisoning and the like, so Kelios in part, you know, is peer-to-peer -peer based. So, uh, you know, if you break down that part of its ability to communicate, uh, you know, they're, you know, they can't talk to each other and not otherwise operate. Um, I said the objective appeared for the takedown for the sake of a takedown. I mean, if you're doing it 
in front of a live audience, you know, probably, you know, you probably don't have the best intentions, right? Uh, but it doesn't look like the alternative channels for the adversary to control it were, were fully investigated. Uh, this is something uh, that I'm working on now, and we're still finding new ways that the adversary kind of controls the infrastructure. Uh, so the big point there is, I mean, if you're going to do a takedown, I mean, aside of a targeted thing for telemetry or some other, you know, non-fatal takedown, is enumerating all the passive communication. So, for instance, Dyer, you've got a DGA, um, you've got some static lists, and uh, I, I think it's Tor. At one point, it was I2P, right? So you've got to be able to go after all of those channels to do a takedown, or the attacker is just going to reassert a control over the infrastructure, and you've just wasted everybody's time uh, for no good reason. Okay. Um, you know, and generally those approaches were, were more of the go it alone, uh, go it alone route. Okay? Uh, this one I was part of uh, with Operation Tovar, uh, specifically the crypto locker piece of it. Uh, Game over Zeus did right along with it. So it was an idea of what kind of, you know, coordination went into it. Uh, 14 different national law enforcement agencies. Uh, just the crypto locker working group was about 150 people uh, all over the place. You know, there's Russia to U.S., China, there's a bunch of people all over involved in it. It generally appeared August, uh, August of 2013. By about October, I was in a position where I could have killed it if I wanted to. Uh, they really only had one mean of communication that was a DGA. It's ransomware, so not exactly a bot, but had bot-like communication structures. Um, so I could have nuked it in October. Uh, you know, the big thing that was on our minds was, you know, hey, you know, uh, is restoring recovered files, uh, you know, but there was also another piece of it uh, that really delayed us, and that was its connection to Game Over Zeus, which, despite ransomware and crypto locker being a big thing, in my mind, at least, Game Over Zeus was a bigger threat. You know, the dollars are bigger, you know, on, on however you measure these things. Certainly, the dollar amounts for Game Over Zeus were bigger. Uh, so we ended up deferring, deferring for that for about six months. Um, uh, kind of my, uh, in my approach to things, like I said, erring on recovery, uh, recovery of files. Uh, and we did eventually recover that server. Uh, we knew that we were going to have it, uh, you know, at a certain point relatively early on, you know, but we wanted to make sure that we can get it and then produce a service and, and a couple of companies were involved in that uh, so that people could recover the files. You know, another aspect of that, there was, there was things that we kind of spit around in a, uh, within a smaller subset of people. It was like, you know, what other creative ways can we take, things down, take this down? And actually, at one point, we were talking about, you know what, we could DDoS this. You know, the remote server's got to generate keys. So there's disk space, there's computational space. This is, this is a good DDoS target. I mean, it, it would kind of be a felony to do it, but, you know, I'm sure somebody would sign off on it, maybe. You know, but again, same problem. You know, yeah, new infections wouldn't happen if I successfully DDoS that server and maintain it over the long term, you know, but people wouldn't be able to buy and get their files back. You know, they'd send bitcoins to these people expecting their money to their, their files to be decrypted, you know, but there'd be nothing for them to reach out to because the server was down. Uh, so that's something that, that ultimately we shied away from. Okay, so I view this as a success, qualified success, right? The two threats are dead and gone, never been heard from again. You know, the actor involved, uh, you know, one of them has a $3 million bounty on his head. He's a Russian citizen, right? You know, an indictment is only good until you get an arrest, you know, but he's not going anywhere. Um, I don't know if he's married or not, so if he is, then and if a wife wants to go to Cyprus, then maybe we got a shot. But short of that, you know, all it is is a $3 million bounty, okay? Uh, the one thing I also did want to point out about this is that there was some private sector to private sector cooperation with Russia and China. Um, uh, we really can't craft a court order to get somebody in China to do something, you know, but Nick.ru was, uh, you know, cooperated and said, okay, we'll do six months of domains if, if memory serves. Uh, I was also able to do targeted takedowns of Chinese domains of a registrar that was at that time at least perceived to be kind of the registrar of choice for Chinese APT. Uh, and they were cooperative, simply by saying, here's a threat, whatever. Uh, so that is one thing, like I said, the private sector can do. I mean, the government of the U.S. and Russia and China and, 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 and mix and match all the international relations problems when governments try to get something done. You know, when they do, it's great. Sometimes they can't. But private entities in those countries that are, you know, 
unfriendly or uncooperative jurisdictions, you know, with, with Western interests, private sector people can still get things done, right? Within certain limits, obviously, they, they've got their laws, we've got our laws. But certainly, you know, we can still do things and disrupt threats, uh, you know, in the lack of, you know, effective international cooperation, right? Uh, and that's changing to a degree to what extent and how fast that changes in terms of international cooperation on, on criminal issues uh, remains to be seen. Oh, one last point. The other piece of this, which is more something the NCA did, and I don't know how much uh, it really penetrated in the U.S. and other places, right, is said, okay, you know, here's the tool you can check if you're infected in an attempt to kind of raise public awareness, not just of these threats, though certainly it did for these threats, you know, but getting to the point where, hey, you know, maybe we can teach the consumer a thing or two using the media cycle, you know, of a takedown to do that, right? Teaching individuals outside, I mean, teaching security awareness, even in enterprises, is kind of a touchy, touch and go kind of thing. Doing security awareness of society writ large, good luck. Who's responsible for that? You know, but if you're going to do a takedown, and there's probably going to be media involved, right? Why not use that opportunity to teach people something so that they're not victims of something else, right? I mean, most criminal threats, you know, I mean, they're, they're higher-end ones, but there's lots of low-rent low rent ones that work still because people don't have a basic idea of how to keep themselves safe. And using these opportunities to teach them a couple of things is certainly something that we should be doing and we should be doing better of. Uh, alien spy, and I have takedown in quotes because this is kind of an unintentional takedown on my part. Uh, alien spy is part of a long strain of Java-based rats, um, you know, currently known as JSocket. Um, you know, so at this point it was alien spy. Did a big report on it, yay. Um, you know, got a blog post out of it and that made marketing happy. You know, but. A technical aspect of this is that all builders, it's a commercial-based RAT service, so you've got to buy a time-based subscription, and you get, you know, the builder, which is a jar file also, and that builder, which also doubles as a command and control server, calls, calls home to verify subscription status. This actor wants to make sure that he gets paid, and he's still getting paid, you know, so... You know, that communication has to happen or the builder doesn't work. And if the builder doesn't work, you don't have access to control any of your victims. Okay. So we published a report. I wasn't precisely clear on what to do with the information. And somebody of their own volition nuked AlienSpy.net, which was a, a purely criminal domain. And so is JSocket.org. Nothing legitimate about it. Take a look. You know, there's nothing legitimate. Suspend the domain seems like a valid course of action. Right. You know, but that kind of led to a chain of events and, and actually I was in the middle of trying to research the mobile malware piece of it and then everything broke. Uh, so this kind of an accidental and unintentional thing which, which it, I wouldn't say it led to more problems but simply they just burned the alien spy name, you know, started calling themselves JSocket, registered a new domain, you know, and then uh, started pushing more product. So, lesson there of, you know, of being clear what to do with some of the data that, that many of us share on some of these private lists. Um, you know. But that said, the interesting thing about that is, is exposed kind of a consequence of the actor's design choices that namely is, like I said, you suspend the domain and then he's got to communicate to all of his customers, hey, download this. You know, they probably lost all their victims. Maybe they can reassert their victims, uh, uh, reassert control over the victims. So it was a very kind of uh, not catastrophic, but jarring consumer experience, for lack of uh, probably a better word, uh, for the attackers. And as a result of that, right, and the interesting path of attack is that if you look on various forums, there's kind of a somewhat negative opinion of, of now JSocket. Because they think all of these, these accidental takedowns, you know, were just kind of part of, you know, an exit strategy. You know what, I just want to get the Bitcoin and then stop running the service, right? Uh, so there's certainly a level of economic and reputation attacks that we can do against adversaries, right? Uh, in the absence of being able to do an arrest, right? You know, it doesn't make any sense to, um, you know, make a criminal, you know, look less reliable if you're just going to arrest them anyway, right? Uh, and we'll get more on that, that in a second, the, the economic reputational attacks. Okay. Uh, I think this is the last case study as Angler. Uh, two months ago, one month ago. 
Cisco said they took down part of Angler. You know, blog post, yay, we took down a uh, $30 million exploit kit operation. You know, but in reality, all it was is that they worked with a hosting provider and said, hey, let's clean up all the Angler, you know, on your network. You know, by the way, feel free to share any intelligence you want with us. You know, with us, you know, and, you know, Cisco got, you know, a new cycle out of it. Good for them, right? But there was really minimal impact to Angler, right? You know, has anybody seen Angler disappear? Nobody? Nope. Not one person can even be sarcastic with me right now? <laughs> anybody? So, um, so, all right, well, yeah, that was my second joke. So I hit the, I hit the plus button too fast, right? The Xindi botnet, no, that wasn't a takedown. That's something that never happened, right? All right. So how takedowns are done, you know, and using the civil process. Law enforcement has their own tools, right? You know, kind of known. Uh, there are some civil paths of action, um, you know, for DNS, relatively easy, you know, uh, because, you know, domains are property. And if you can find some standing, which is uh, what another point there, you know, you could say, hey, you're harming me, you're doing this bad thing, uh, this, pro this property, you know, needs to be suspended, right? Uh, so most of the civil takedowns, non-law enforcement happen this way, uh, you know, of, of there's some civil action saying, you know, give me a restraining order because this person's actively engaging in harm, all right? There's some other contractual means. Almost every provider of services has some AUP, assuming it's not a criminal provider that caters to providing services for criminals, at which point I guess you could report to them, but it's not like that they care, they'll laugh at you. You know, but for otherwise legitimate companies, you know, uh, you know, hey, you've got a problem on your network, violate your terms of service, you should do something about that, right? Um, which kind of goes into to, to Frank's talk a little bit of, of working with ISPs and having some of that direct communication uh, instead of just blowing up Twitter and everything, uh, you know, working with an ISP to clean things up, right? Uh, relatively easy, uh, sometimes requires more of a relationship than others, you know, but, uh, you know, hopefully there's an abuse to ask to deal with this stuff, right? Uh, civil litigation, right, comes with standing issues, uh, which probably any like you know, uh, this is probably true in any legal system. Though I'm not a uh, international or a legal studies expert, right? In the United States, I can't say, hey, you know what, take down this domain because it's bad. I have to have some kind of skin in the game, right? It needs to be attacking me or attacking one of my constituents or a customer or something like that, you know. So part of the reason Microsoft you know, uses this to great effect is that everybody's practically Microsoft's customers, even people who don't really want to be Microsoft's customers are using their stuff. So Microsoft has great standing and they've got lawyers all over the place, right? You know, I'm a small company, 300 people, right? You know, I'm not going to be able to sit there and file, file lawsuits in every country on the planet. And it doesn't make sense for us to ever to build that capacity, but can do it in certain targeted ways, but it's really got to be our customers, something like that, which really reduces the scope of what I can do using litigation. So kind of economic, going back to the economic reputational attacks, right? Probably a fairly underused, uh, not fairly, it is an underused tactic that can be used in certain circumstances, right? Uh, probably not, I mean, if there's gonna be an arrest, why make somebody look bad and not make money, right? You know, but if you can't really get to somebody, right? You know, uh, you can use takedowns to maximize kind of their reputational harm. So in the case of Alien Spy, right? It was an accidental. So I wasn't even set up to do this when this happened, right? You know, but this is a service provider providing services to other criminals, right? And the biggest problem they have, we've got our problems, they've got a problem, right? How do criminals trust other criminals, right? I mean, you know the other guy's not honest, he's a criminal, right? You know, and, and people defraud other criminals all the time, right? I mentioned exit strategy on there, you know, which is uh, used mostly for like Bitcoin exchanges and the like. Uh, but it, it, it's a tactic that can be used anywhere. It's like, you know, oh, I've got all this money because people are passing Bitcoin through me. And then one day, oh, sorry, all the Bitcoin wallets got stole, stolen, closed. No, they just kind of put the wallets in their pocket and walked away, right? You know, they're criminals. They're going to steal. They'll steal from other criminals. It's not like, you know, there's no honor among thieves. That being said, you know, you can maximize that impact with, you know, with, uh, you know, with a takedown operation. If you can't get an arrest, you can't get to somebody else, right? You could say, hey, you know what? Next time I take down now JSocket, sit there and say, you know, get on the forums and sit there and push the idea that this guy's a fraudster. At which point, if he's not making money, the threat goes away. Now, 
granted, you know, may go to somebody else, may craft a new identity, but crafting identities take time, crafting time or reputation takes time, crafting trust takes a lot of time, right? So certainly, you know, it's a very damaging thing to do, right? You can use this against other threats, and I mentioned Kellios uh, specifically, right? Kellios is a spam botnet, you know, a lot of pill scams. Um, we'll talk about pill scams in specific, right? You know, the operator of Kellios is not pushing drugs, right? They just run a spam botnet. That's all they do, and you know, they get paid based on people, you know, their ability to deliver tons of emails, you know. But these pill companies have a supply chain and whatever. I can go after them and say, all right, you know, you can use Kellios, that's fine, you know, but we're going to take your stuff in a civil process with, you know, the FTC or whatever, at which point, you know, all right, maybe they stop sending pill scams, right? There's an economic counterbalance there. So certainly a lot of things that we can do, uh, do in those regards to deal with kind of these persistent spam botnet problems that have been around forever and aren't going away, at least for a certain subset of, of scams, right? You know, part of Kellios is Russian dating spam. I don't know how to do a reputation attack against that because I don't know why people would look at a Russian mail order bride over email and actually send money. I can't get my mind around that. But uh, people do this. Uh, so dealing with non-cooperating jurisdictions, I put that in end quotes, right? You know, because it's not really a value judgment. I mean. You know, I'm an American. Like I said, American government has had historical problems getting cooperation from Russia and China. I'm not taking a side in that. It just is what it is, right? I'm a citizen. I've got no influence on that crap, you know. But just because the governments can't cooperate, it certainly means, it doesn't mean private sector entities can't also, right? Or can't, can't interact, you know. So, unfortunately, like I said, that, that involves a fair bit of travel, right? You know, to build those relationships, you know, uh, going other places and say, hey, you know, okay, you're seeing this stuff in the United States. All right, I'll go to help you deal with that problem. I'm seeing this stuff in the Russian Federation. Go help me out with that, right? You know, certainly might not necessarily lead to arrests. Well, it might, you know, if the actor is somewhere in a jurisdiction that we can reach, right? You know, uh, but that's basically relationship maintenance, and there's no good way of doing that except actual FaceTime, right? And, you know, what I tell my wife who, you know, and my kids who don't understand why I travel so much, it's like I can get more done sitting in a room with somebody for 15 minutes than I can three months over email. You know, working virtually, you know, of people that are kind of outside a small circle of, you know, of an organization or whatever, it just takes a lot of time, right? You know, but getting everybody in the same room saying, let's deal with this, we can resolve things relatively quickly, right? But unfortunately, that means, you know, I've got almost 250,000 frequent flyer miles for just this year. Um, but my family's going to get a good vacation out of it, so they can't complain that much, right? Uh, but trust lists, electronic, uh, you know, groups, you know, they're good, right? You know, I have several, uh, you know, many, many of you are in them, you know, they're not bad things. I'm not bagging on it, but it's not enough. It, it actually takes time to build relationships outside of your own geography, okay? So my particular entry requirements, so to speak, you know, of, of when I'm going to actually pull the trigger on something is, is the first is willing partners, right? You know, I'm hugely busy, and there's only so much my expertise is in certain things, right? I need other people to be involved, and if not other people are interested, okay, well, nobody's interested. I'll go move on to something that people are interested on, and it's pretty easy to, to find something that somebody's interested in, right? You know, some relevant threat, right? You know, obvious, I'm not going to go after something that's, that's nonsense or, you know, some, some low-rent stuff, unless there's a good reason for me to do it, right? Uh, third point, you know, thorough knowledge, you know, of the primary and backup means of communication, right? I don't want to shoot something in the head and only hit its foot, you know? I want to kill, I don't want a flesh wound, you know? And the only way to do that is know how it communicates, and then, you know, you're going to run into Tor and I2P stuff that is complicated but not impossible to resolve, right? Which might, you know, but there might be a case that's like, I really want to kill this, but I can't because I can't get to all of the resources necessary to do it, right? You know, and doing that risk analysis that I mentioned is like, you know, what's the risk of collateral damage, you know, when, and what's the risk of deception, which I'm not talking about a great deal here, but the attackers know what we're looking at. They know how to deceive us, right? Uh, and it's very, it's a lot easier than we think, right? So making sure that is this, am I really shooting what I think I'm shooting, or are they somehow, you know, screwing with my intelligence? Wrapping it up, 
you know, takedowns, just another form of disruption that we do every day, right? It's not something unique and distinct. It's just part of the spectrum of operations. You know, like you having some ultimate objectives, you know, is the key of, you know, what do I want to accomplish? Not a takedown for the sake of a takedown and marketing, right? You know, and, and deconflicting at least with law enforcement, if not working, right? You know, to make sure that I don't scotch a case uh, to put somebody in jail because I'd rather have people in jail than to have a notch in my belt and a takedown. You know, cooperation, you know, having, having broad cooperation across jurisdictions, right? Global problem, you know, needs to have global partners, right? Um, and being better, the last point, of informing the public, right? Taking these opportunities when, you know, there is actually a lot of media around something and say, hey, you know what? Yeah, we took this down, you know, this ransomware family, you know, but really pay attention to not opening zip files with an HTML file that redirects and then involves, it infects your machine with ransomware. Don't do that because it's not legitimate email. Uh, certainly take some of those steps to just inform, you know, Joe Six Pack or whatever the equivalent expression is in other countries for the common person and teach them something uh, about security, all right? Uh, so I forgot all my business cards because I dropped my laptop off in the hotel, but there's my information. If you want to get in touch with anything that I do, there's a bunch of groups that I run. Uh, feel free to get in touch because I'm always looking for more people to do more things. So questions? <laughs> It was revealed that uh, after a botnet is taken down, it is uh, transferred to FBI and it is transferred to NSA, and uh, they uh, filter the targets for some juicy victims. And God knows what happens with that. What is your short opinion about this? My short opinion is is that if I'm doing a takedown and we're sinkholing, the sinkholing is for victim notification. And odds are I will probably use Shadow Server for that because they're set up for it. I, you know, I, I do do tactical sinkholing, right, you know, uh, of, to gather intelligence, but doing kind of long-term stuff. Let Shadow Server do it, victim notification. If Shadow Server is cooperating with the NSA, I, I, I guess eventually somebody will figure that out. We use somebody else, right? That's just not what that's for, right? So, uh, you know, if I caught that, then, you know, I'd, there'd be a lot less cooperation with me with whatever party was playing that stunt in the future. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, you mentioned mm. earlier in your slides um, about limited success of Drydex campaign. Uh, could you elaborate why wasn't that enough people sent to Gallows Poll or, or, or what? Um, I wasn't part of that operation, but there was there, there were aspects of it that I thought were going to be done that weren't done. Um, and like I said, this is where I'm kind of being intentionally vague. Um, but you know, it's not dead and gone, right? Right. You know, there was an arrest. An arrest is good. Um, not having firsthand intelligence about who it is, it seems like they arrested one of the affiliates and not necessarily their primary actor. So. Arrests are good, right? You know, you know, Eric, arrest more people. Have fun, right? <laughs> I, I, you know, but still a threat still out there, right? Uh, so I, I would say limited success. I mean, it's still, like I said, success is, I'll, I'll take anything, right? You know, I'm, I'm a beggar, right? Married, four kids, driver carries no cash. I'll take anything. <laughs> so it's, it's not yet over. Right. OK, thanks. Mm -hmm. a, a last question over there. Hi, uh, Magal. Would you say about Drydex that since the rest there was significant uh, change in activity, in Drydex activity? Um, I don't know if my data has, has full visibility into Drydex to be able to answer that authoritatively. My, uh, and it's not something that, that I've personally looked at in the past few weeks. My impression is I don't know if there's been significant changes. Um, or what I would describe as significant changes. Now, that being said, there's certainly a place for arresting affiliates, and I think that's on people's minds, is if I'm using Drydex, does that mean I'm the next one to get arrested? Uh, and I think that has value, Some uh, going to kind of the economic reputational attacks. Uh, I don't know if that was really maximized in this case, because I wasn't really part of that particular operation. Does that answer your question? Kind of. More or less, yeah. Yeah. Thank you.
want Thank to get you. to pizza and drinks, right? You yeah. know. Yeah. I can give you, a dissertation. We, we would you go for another 15 minutes. No. No. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you.